Center, I'm going to welcome on stage is John Bovey, who's from the University of Connecticut. So welcome, John. Thank you, Claire. <sighs> All right, so um, happy happy to be here at the at the New York Produce Show again to talk about GMO labeling and non-GMO food labels. Um, so this is based on a couple of different papers that I'm in the process of working on and that I've published. Uh, I'll go through an introduction and overview of what we're talking about when we say GMO, non-GMO, and the debate over GE food labeling, um, non-GMO labels, and then I'll talk about a federal law that has implications for food marketing. Um, so as everybody knows, in recent years, there's been an increased interest in non-GE labels, in non-GE food, in natural and organic food. Um, and there's been a proliferation of non-GMO labels in response to this increased interest in such foods. There's soon going to be a federal law that requires disclosure of GE content in foods. Um, and this definitely has implications for marketing food and also for consuming and producing food. Um, so just as general background, what do I mean when I say G GE? Genetically engineered or genetic engineering. Um, G GMO is a slightly different concept in terms of definition, genetically modified organism. There's no universal definition, though, of genetic engineering or GE. Um, a common type of definition is, as I have on the screen here, the manipulation of an organism's genes by introducing, eliminating, or rearranging specific genes using modern molecular biology techniques, particularly RDNA. But that's not what we always mean when we say genetic engineering. FDA has a slightly different definition that talks about targeted changes to a plant's genetic makeup. Um, so GE ingredients are commonly used in food manufacturing and processing. They're commonly used in, in all kinds of different foods, including breakfast cereals, snack foods, as sweeteners, starches, and oils. Um, a lot of people know that more than 90% of corn and soybean acreage in the US uses genetic engineering technology. And this technology mainly uh, is focused on improving yields or production of foods, especially for the first 20 years or so. Genetic engineering was targeted for insect resistance, disease resistance, or herbicide tolerance for the most part. Um, so this is a chart that shows the number of petitions or uh, events uh, approved by USDA for non-regulated status of GE crops. Not all of these are in commercial use, but you can see the top three listed, corn, soybeans, and cotton. These are predominantly where the research attention has been, where the money has been. Um, there are a few produce commodities on this list. Tomato, which isn't in commercial use. Uh, potato, I'll talk about that more in a minute. Squash, papaya, and apple. So sweet corn, uh, like uh, commodity corn has been uh, used, developed for insect resistance. Um, the innate potato has health benefits. It has less acrylamide in it. Uh, that's cancer-causing compound. Squash, zucchini, and papaya have all been developed to be virus resistant. In fact, in Hawaii, um, genetic engineering pretty much saved the papaya industry in Hawaii because a virus uh, was decimating the industry. And the Arctic apple is a new pr product that's out there that browns uh, less quickly than conventional apples. So these are some commo produce commodities that have GE varieties. A lot of these are developed more recently, and there may be a lot more on the horizon. Um, so what is non-GE food? That's not as simple as you think, as you probably think. Um, these are typically products that have verification requirements related to inspection uh, and, and also testing final products but they usually allow for some adventitious or accidental presence of GE material at low rates, usually below 1%. Um, so it's not necessarily products that have been produced without GE, but it's at least products that have GE in low, uh, uh, low levels, but usually with some non-zero tolerance. So the, food, the debate over GE food labeling has been focused around mandatory labels. Those who advocate mandatory labels have typically claimed that GE technology poses significant potential risks to human health or the environment, and also that consumers have the right to know what's in our food products. On the other side of the argument, those opposed to mandatory labeling uh, 
point to the scientific evidence, which shows that GE technology doesn't pose health risks. And economists point to market failure and the issue that um, GE food labeling, mandatory labeling, would not solve a market failure because it wouldn't improve the symmetry of information. There are already lots of food labels out there that voluntarily state non-GE. And from this, consumers may be able to infer that any product not carrying a non-GE label is, in fact, genetically engineered. And also, mandatory labels aren't going to solve any human health or environmental problems. On their own, they're not going to reduce the use of certain chemicals that are associated with certain types of GE uh, crops. Again, human health implications are really uh, haven't been proven by science yet and, and, and don't seem likely to be. Um, so the debate over mandatory labels is typically framed as a debate between consumers and farmers um, and biotech firms. Consumers on the one hand who want labels and farmers and biotech firms who don't. There have also been, uh, there's been a large role for non-governmental organizations, environmental groups uh, that have widely portrayed Monsanto as, uh, as somehow malicious, sometimes discredited academic researchers. Images like this are available online. I'm not sure if that's been doctored, but Monsanto is definitely portrayed in a bad light a lot of the time. Monsanto being one of the primary developers of GE technology. The media has often emphasized bad news about GMOs and falsehoods. They've given comparatively less attention to stories that report good news on GMOs. Um, so the industry, uh, obviously there are members of the industry on both sides of the mandatory labeling issue. The organic industry certainly in favor of labeling. Some other members of the industry support mandatory labeling and some oppose it. Um, consumers don't have as much choice in the matter. Retail, what, what consumers buy is dependent on what retailers offer. And so, for instance, um, Walmart and Safeway and other retailers over the years have opted not to sell milk from cows that have been treated with RBST uh, growth hormone. Um, so people who are shopping at those grocery stores don't have the choice of whether or not they're going to buy that milk. McDonald's and McCain have opted not to use genetically engineered potatoes over the years, historically, because of concerns about bad publicity. Um, so, again, those in favor of mandatory labeling have talked about the right to know. They've talked about increasing the range of choices available to consumers. But, in fact, uh, what they may be seeking is an effective or de facto ban on genetically engineered products. That's been seen in Europe, where mandatory labels have been in place for over a decade. Um, last thing I want to mention about the arguments in favor of mandatory labeling is that the precautionary principle has been invoked, that um, advocates of mandatory labeling say that there may be irreversible costs that are generated by the use of genetic engineering technology. Um, on the other hand, as I said before, the opponents of mandatory labeling oppose it because uh, the weight of scientific evidence certainly says there's nothing to be concerned about in terms of risks to human health. Um, on the economic side, it introduces cost and changes both consumer and producer behavior, while at the same time singling out a particular technology as a cause for concern. Um, why, for instance, should there be a label on genetically engineered food when there's not a label on food saying what workers are paid or uh, what the carbon footprint of the food is? Um, Eustace Wessler has talked about irreversible, be irreversible benefits and applied the precautionary principle to GE technology um, from that perspective, saying that if we, do, if we don't continue to invest in ag R&D and improve the affordability of food, this could have irreversible costs. Um, so against mandatory labeling, economists like me argue that voluntary labels increase consumer choice whereas mandatory labels actually decrease consumer choice. That has been what's played out in Europe. Um, it is likely that, that retailers, when confronted with uh, mandatory labels on genetically engineered food, are going to want to avoid carrying those labels, products with those labels. But I'll talk about that more in a bit. Um, so there are, many there are going to be many costs from mandatory labels to all different sectors of the, of the, of the economy, farmers, manufacturers, consumers, taxpayers, that aren't going to be offset by benefits. Um, Cass Sunstein, who gained a lot of fame working for the Obama administration, argued that 
the benefits from mandatory labels are based solely on a misunderstanding of the science and, in addition, the argument that consumers have a right to know. Um, but it's very hard to quantify this, the benefits from a right to know. And it's hard to, to according to Cass Sunstein, it's hard to um, characterize benefits as accruing from a misunderstanding of the science. Um, on the other hand, while we have zero or arguably very low benefits, the costs may be substantial. There are going to be costs from enforcing the law, but to manufacturers and producers from complying with the law, um, segregating GE from non-GE inputs, and reformulating products. This is going to lead to higher food prices, and in the long run, stifle investment in ag R&D, uh, while imposing costs on a select group of producers. So before I get into the details of the federal uh, bioengineered food disclosure standard, I'm going to talk about non-GMO labels for a few minutes. Um, it's important to know that there's no federal standard for what uh, non-GMO means. Um, there's also no federal standard for how you would verify that a product is non-GMO. It is worth noting that organic foods are required by USDA to be made without GE ingredients. Um, so the, the, there are many labels out there, but the predominant one, the, the one that's really dominated the market, is the non-GMO project label. So this is uh, what I have here in the upper right-hand corner, pretty logo with a butterfly on it. Um, this is a nonprofit organization. They charge a small fee, $50 per product, for uh, product for producers, marketers who want to carry this label. And over the last year or so, they've grown from under 30,000 products with that logo on it to over 44,000 products. It's really experienced tremendous growth. Um, so the way this works, as I said, you pay a small fee, $50, to a nonprofit, the non-GMO project. And then you also pay fees to technical administrators. There are, last I checked, four technical administrators who are third-party companies that um, verify that the products are non-GMO. Uh, these four technical administrators work with 20 labs around the world to test for GMO content in the food and in the supply chain, and then the technical administrators verify it. And um, as I show here, th this can be reasonably expensive. In addition to paying the lab fees, you pay the technical administrator up to $3,500 for a single product, but there are bulk discounts available, and the different companies have different fee structures. This is all available on the non-GMO project's website. Um, Generally speaking, usually products that have this logo have to meet a threshold of no more than 0.9% GE content by weight, but the details do vary a little bit. I've got some footnotes in a USDA report um, that was just published last month that, uh, that tells the details about what the standard means in different cases. Um, but an important thing is that non-GMO project uh, puts the, these ingredients on a, on a risk list, and I won't read through it. But it's going to be more expensive to get the logo if your food has ingredients that are on this risk list. These are typically or more commonly genetically engineered ingredients. And um, so it takes more to document that your food is free of GE or non-GMO if it has one of these ingredients. Um, but the thing is that this label, the non-GMO project logo, doesn't, uh, doesn't reduce all consumer confusion or it doesn't, it doesn't improve the quality of information transmitted to consumers about non-GMO and GMO products. Because um, as, as some of you probably know, all, uh, all, all organics are non-GMO, but also any products that don't have, for the most part, any products that don't have these ingredients on the, the risk list are going to be non-GMO, unless there's some accidental contamination. So. So I've listed a few products here that are certainly going to be non-GMO, whether or not they carry that label. But again, not everybody knows this. Not everybody knows that 100% peanut butter is non-GMO because there are no genetically engineered peanuts out there. Um, not, on the other hand, not everybody knows the, ingre the ingredients that are commonly going to be genetically engineered, like papayas. I just heard a story yesterday about a papaya farmer who didn't know that papayas are typically genetically engineered. Um, high fructose corn syrup and soy are obviously commonly, very commonly genetically engineered because they're made from crops, commodities that are typically genetically engineered. Um, in addition, it's really worth noting that, that this non-GMO project is perhaps the market leader 
This logo is, as I said, on 3% of food products, but um, you can also make a non-GMO claim, certainly, without having that particular logo on your product. So I just took this picture on the train this morning. Um, Amtrak is selling cookies that have this non-GMO label on them, but it's not the non-GMO project's label. It's just, it's just the word, non-GMO. So this is everywhere. It's not just in the high-end retailers. It's even on Amtrak. Um, so I took these screenshots uh, from the non-GMO projects website. They list all 44,000 products that they have their logo on. Um, these particular screenshots are of products that are never going to be genetically modified, yet they carry the genetic, the non-GMO logo. Um, so different types of 100% juice, different types of organic vegetables, they're always going to be non-GM, um, but these companies have paid extra to carry that non-GMO project logo. So there's definitely a potential for marketing uh, you, your food as non-GMO because not all consumers know about um, what products contain GMOs. And, um, and this is just one way to, to get the consumer's attention and potentially capture more market share. Not sure whether that's paying off, but, but 44,000 products are carrying the logo. So obviously, a lot of companies are, are seeing some benefit from it, at least in terms of competition. Um, Okay, so getting back to the mandatory labeling standard or mandatory disclosure standard, which is now a federal law and it hasn't yet been implemented, but it was passed by Congress in 2016. I'll give you a little bit of background on that legislation. Um, there was state level legislation proposed in at least 25 states by 2014. It passed in a few states. Um, there were referendums, popular referendums in four states. Uh, it failed in each state when the electorate voted on it, but it passed in a few states by the legislature. Um, so Alaska, way back in 2005, decided to require labeling of any GE fish that was sold in the state. And uh, this was a preemptive thing. FDA did not approve GE Atlantic salmon until 2015, but that had been under development for about 10 years. And so Alaska was obviously trying to protect their uh, salmon industry and um, so genetically engineered salmon exists it's been approved by FDA but as safe for human consumption but FDA hasn't yet approved labels so it's not yet available for sale um, Connecticut where I'm from now um, where I live now passed a law in 2013 that was going to be conditional on four other northeastern states with a total population of at least 20 million passing similar laws to require labeling of genetically engineered food um, Maine in 2013 passed a law very similar to Connecticut's. Um, and then in 2014, Vermont passed, Vermont's legislature passed Act 120, which was the nation's first unconditional mandatory labeling law. Um, excuse me for a sec. So Vermont's law went into effect in July of last year. But it had a six-month grace period for any products that were distributed before July 1st. Um, so it never really went into effect uh, in a meaningful way. Um, and, and it motivated Congress to pass a law that would uh, prevent market disruptions from Vermont and potentially other states down the line passing their own mandatory labeling laws. Um, the first proposal in Congress was the Safe and Accurate Food Labeling Act of 2015. This would have established national standards for both voluntary non-GE labels and voluntary GE labels. And it would have prohibited states from establishing their own labeling requirements. It passed the House, but it was narrowly rejected by the Senate in a nearly party line vote. Um, so Republicans favored this law, generally, and Democrats opposed it. Um, and a compromise was needed to pass the Senate. Um, they came up with the... Uh, ingenious solution of taking a bill that had already gone through committee and then uh, gutting it, taking the text completely away from this bill to reauthorize the Sea Grant program, replaced all that text with a compromised GE labeling bill to save time and get it through Congress more quickly. So this compromise bill gained support from both Democrats and Republicans. The Republicans supported it because it preempted state labeling requirements. 
Um, it also didn't establish voluntary non-GE labeling standards, which, uh, which I guess Democrats perhaps would have supported. But the, the important thing that, that got the Democratic support it needed was that it required a mandatory disclosure standard for certain foods that contain GE ingredients. And it passed the Senate with 63 votes um, in July of last year and was signed into law by the end of the month. So this immediately nullified Vermont's law. It says that any state um, enforcing a standard for mandatory GE labeling must enforce the same standard as the federal national bioengineered food disclosure standard. Um, USDA hasn't yet released a proposed rule, so we're still unclear about a lot of the details of this law. Um, and in order to talk about what it may look like, my co-author Julian Austin and I looked at uh, California's Prop 37, Vermont's Act 120, and the provisions they contained. So just to make it clear, this was a bill, it's a six-page piece of legislation, but the detailed regulations haven't yet been written by USDA. And there's a lot of, and there are a lot of details that aren't in those six pages of legislation that are still yet to be determined. Um, so California's Prop 37 was going to be a zero tolerance standard. Again, it did not pass, this was a referendum, it did not pass um, and it never and it never went into effect, um, and so it was going to be zero tolerance. Would have required labels, um, and penalties would have been uh, assessed through private litigation and settlements. And that's important because we don't know yet how the penalties are going to be assessed under the the U.S. federal law. Vermont's Act 120. Uh, had a different penalty structure in place, the state would have fined manufacturers $1,000 per day per product that reached grocery store shelves. Producers would have needed to obtain sworn statements from suppliers or undergo third-party verification. Um, and some national producers were planning to, or actually did cease, for, for a brief time, cease distributing products to Vermont. In fact, I have a, uh, I mean, I, I had a conversation with a manufacturer who said that they were planning to do this, but I even have a friend whose mother bakes baklava in New Hampshire, and she stopped shipping it to the grocery stores in Vermont that carried it for a few weeks last July um, because of this GE labeling standard. Um, so foods uh, exempt from the proposed requirements in California and the EU and Vermont, um, th these all give some indication of how the US federal law may play out. Um, exemptions are, are, are an inherent part of all of these uh, requirements that, that have been put into effect and that have been proposed, um, partly just for logistical reasons and partly to protect industries. For example, Vermont explicitly exempted food produced with GE enzymes. So cheese is typically produced with a genetically engineered enzyme. Cheese is a relatively important food product in Vermont, and so I don't think it's a coincidence that it was written into the Vermont legislation. Um, all right, so getting to the federal standard um, and the implementation of it and the economic effects of it. Again, many details are yet to be determined. Um, so we don't know how it's going to be enforced. We know that U.S. So, um, so we know that USDA is going to be prohibited from recalling foods. This is part of the legislation. We don't know whether lawsuits are going to be allowed. Um, we also know that, that under the legislation, the definition of genetic engineering is fairly limited. Um, it's only genetic, in, genetic material that's been modified through in vitro RDNA techniques and for which the modification could not otherwise be obtained through conventional breeding or found in nature. This definition excludes the newer technologies for gene editing, like CRISPR and Talon, and also excludes gene deletion, like the technology that was used to create white button mushrooms, which are very common, of course. 
Um, so it's, it's still yet to be resolved, but based on the legislation, it seems unlikely that products made using those particular technologies are going to require labeling. Um, how is GE material going to be disclosed? There are three options under the legislation. There's a text statement, such as it's, this would be something that's totally transparent, such as made with genetic engineering or may be produced with genetically engineered ingredients. It could be a symbol which USDA is supposed to be developing, a uniform symbol, maybe sort of like the organic symbol, or it could be a QR code. I'll talk about the QR code more in a bit. Um, there are going to be some alternative compliance options for small manufacturers. Um, again, yet to be determined is the threshold for the labeling requirements. It's almost certainly going to be not a zero tolerance, but we don't know what it's going to be. We don't know whether USDA or FEA is going to enforce it. We don't know whether there are going to be random tests or random audits or record keeping requirements, or simply whether it's going to be enforced based on competitor or consumer complaints. Um, so this, is, this next bit is a bit complicated. Um, like a lot of laws, there's, there's some really subtle uh, language and, and seemingly con uh, unnecessarily complicated language here. But foods that are going to be covered by the mandatory labeling requirements, um, that is um, foods that are going to have to carry the label if they have genetically engineered ingredients, are only those foods for which the predominant or second leading ingredient is regulated by FDA. And also, in addition to that, products for which the predominant ingredient is broth, stock, water, or similar solution. So obviously the second part of this, it excludes soups and it excludes beverages. Um, soda products, those are, those are often made, or almost always made, with high fructose corn syrup. So this is another instance of a product that is, um, that is made with genetic engineering, but it's going to be excluded, just like the Vermont uh, cheese exemption. Um, now, what's regulated by FDA? It has to have the first or second ingredient regulated by FDA to be covered by the law. A rule of thumb that I've used over the years is everything besides meat, poultry, egg products, and catfish, but the details are actually more complicated. They're, they're in this table that fills a whole page and you can't read it on the screen. Um, it shows you the jurisdiction for regulation of food products by FDA and USDA. So there's a lot of gray area for products that contain just a bit of meat. What's, what exactly is the definition of egg product? Um, in addition to this, there are going to be explicit exemptions for restaurant food and organic food, which, as I said, it's made, it, they must be made without genetic engineering. But as long as you carry that organic logo, you're not going to have to have a disclosure statement. So um, that makes sense. But here's a diagram that we developed that shows the, the share of US genetically engineered corn that could be used in food products sold without GE labels. Um, so out of all the US, G, uh, US produced GE corn, only about 10% of it goes to human consumption. Um, the rest goes to exports, animal feed, biofuels, and seed. About 1% of the total corn produced is used in alcoholic beverages. Um, and about a third of food that's consumed is sold away from home in restaurants and similar establishments. So that's also going to be unregulated. There's not going to be a label required for restaurant food. Um, there are also going to be exemptions potentially based on how that corn is used in food sold for at-home consumption. So high fructose corn syrup, it's possible that it won't be regulated because there's no protein in it, so you can't test the DNA to see whether it's genetically engineered. Um, so all, all in all, you can see that, that less than 10% and potentially even closer to 5% or less of all the GE corn that's produced is going to be used in a food product that has to be sold with the label. Picture is really similar for soybeans. We just did this for corn and soybeans, just for illustration. Um, soybeans end up in a lot of food products that we're not necessarily aware of as proteins, as soybean oil. Um, and so the, the share of soybeans that ends up uh, in a product that requires a label may be as high as 12%. But it's still a very small share of all the GE soybeans that are produced. Um, again, uh, well, I'm not sure I said this. USDA, uh, we know from the legislation, is not allowed to fine manufacturers or retailers for noncompliance. But we don't know yet whether states are going to be able to issue fines for noncompliance with the federal law. 
if states are able to issue fines for noncompliance, um, there may be a patchwork that emerges. It could be that Vermont's going to issue fines and Massachusetts isn't, and, and Iowa isn't, and California is, and so there could be a patchwork that emerges just the same as if the law wasn't in place. But at least it's a consistent standard, and at least the manufacturers know what that standard is, and they don't have to adopt different labels for different states that have slightly different requirements. Um, again, so many of these details are undetermined. We don't know whether products are going to have to undergo testing, uh, whether single ingredient products are going to be exempt from testing, whether multi ingredient products that are a combination of products that are presumably non GE are going to have to undergo testing. Um, there's so many products that are out here on the on the floor of the produce show that are mixed different products, uh, different vegetables and other ingredients, all of which might be non-GE. But again, we just don't know until USDA releases their proposed regulation what the um, standard is going to be for which products have to be tested. Um, furthermore, we don't know who's going to be verifying all this. Are third party verifiers going to be accredited? Um, is there going to be a role for non-GMO project, this nonprofit organization? Uh, presumably, they're very interested in this, uh, in this federal uh, regulation and see some new opportunities here. Um, but on the other hand, marketers may not be so interested in carrying those labels if, uh, if all the GE products have to have a disclosure statement. Um, so in the paper, we talk about the likely economic consequences and compare it with a patchwork and also a uh, future regime in which there were no mandatory labels. Um, the key is that, is that there are different stages of the supply chain, obviously, and the responses of retailers depends in part on the responses of consumers. The responses of producers depends in part on whether retailers are willing to carry products that have the disclosure statement. So that's the big picture in terms of the economic analysis. There are a lot of unknowns because we don't know how consumers are going to respond. We don't know how the retailers are going to respond. Um, and, and how the producers respond is going to depend on what the retailers are asking for. What the retailers are asking for depends on what the consumers are buying. Um, so starting with consumers and working backwards up the supply chain. For the most part, consumers are unlikely to have an increased willingness to pay for GE products, even though um, there are reasons to support genetic engineering, uh, world hunger, the newest GE crops have improved in nutritional characteristics and appearance, as I was talking about for a few minutes earlier. Um, it's possible that, uh, that a few consumers would have an increased willingness to pay, but this really isn't likely to happen. Um, it's more likely that the national standard is going to increase consumer awareness of GE and induce consumers to shift their demand towards the organics and towards the products that are explicitly labeled non-GMO. Um, there's, there's also a hypothesis that mandatory disclosure could increase consumer awareness and acceptance. A couple of friends put, put a piece in the Wall Street Journal that made the argument that um, that, that is a possible outcome. Um, but for the most part, we expect that consumers' demand is going to be negligible. They're not going to respond much to it one way or the other, or that they're going to shift away from products that carry the non-GE claim and possibly towards products that have non-GMO labels of one type or another. So let's talk about QR codes for a few minutes. Who here uses QR codes? Some people do. My undergraduate class, 35 students, none of them used it. None of them even seemed to know what it was. So this is a technology, maybe it came into fashion for a couple of years, five or 10 years ago, but it's really not used a lot nowadays by consumers. Um, if you have a QR reader on your phone, you can scan this code and see that it says, may contain genetically engineered ingredients. If you're in the grocery store and you're scanning products to find out whether they have GE ingredients, you may be directed to websites or receive a text saying something ambiguous. May contain is a true statement even for products that do in fact contain it. It may or may not. It's still a true statement. Um, so are consumers going to understand that may contain is an ambiguous statement, a flawed statement? It's, un, it's unclear how consumers are going to respond. And there are going to be a lot of studies done on this issue. So um, consum consumers could have a really adverse reaction. This is, this is kind of a joke, but some consumers might re react to QR codes by avoiding the products, by assuming that the retailer 
and the manufacturer has something to hide and avoiding the products that have these disclosure statements as QR codes. Um, so Brad Rickard was in the room for several hours today and he uh, gave a very nice presentation earlier. He and some co-authors at Cornell um, did this very interesting study a few years ago where they found that consumers had uh, asymmetric reactions to information about genetic engineering in their food. So if there was an unlabeled granola bar, they, their willingness to pay for it was, uh, was different. The, the differential willingness to pay for the unlabeled granola bar versus the one that had genetically modified ingredients was different from an unlabeled granola bar versus one that said free of genetically engineered ingredients. So in this context, there were two products and they were labeled differently and the labels should have conveyed the same information. If you see a label that says free of GE, you're probably gonna assume that the other one is GE, but consumers had different reactions to this information. So um, this is evidence that consumers aren't looking at the non-GMO labels and saying, oh, everything else must be GE. And they're not going to look at the products that have the GE labels and say, oh, everything else is non-GE also. This is really a problem because it means that the information that's being transmitted under the, in order to comply with the federal law, it's just not effective. It's not giving consumers complete information. It's not really alleviating the imperfect information that, that they have now. Um, other friends of mine, Brandon McFadden and Jason Lusk, did a similar study. It was just published a few months ago. And these bars on the chart represent uh, willingness to pay premiums for example in treatment one, the non-GMO verified logo versus a QR code. And they found a 32 cent premium in this particular um, treatment for the, for the non-GMO versus the, the QR code. The QR code says contains genetically engineered ingredients. So, um, so a lot of these results make sense, at least in terms of the, the, the sign, the fact that consumers would prefer the non-GMO or the organic product. But if you look at the last treatment in the, in the last column over here, you have the QR code, which sends them a message saying contains genetically engineered ingredients. And then the text statement contains genetically engineered ingredients. They're willing to pay almost a 40 cent premium for a pound of apples that has a QR code as opposed to the text statement. So this represents a huge opportunity for marketers. If they're forced to comply with the law, they're very likely to choose the QR code because it's so innocuous. Um, so in the paper, as I said, I'm working on a paper with Julian Austin from UC Davis where we look at these economic effects. Um, we talk about the consumer response and the retailer response and the, and the manufacturer and the, and the farmer response. Um, this is likely to, to um, the retailers are likely to respond to competitors. Some retailers are likely to move first and require products that don't carry the label to be the only ones that they sell. Um, and and if, some, if some retailers are in fact requiring um, the, 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 the products they carry avoid carrying the D GE disclosure statements, um, then producers that are hoping to reach those buyers, they're gonna to have to incur a lot of costs. They're gonna to have to incur the segregation cost and the verification cost to prove that they're not required to carry that label. Um, but it all depends on, on the, the retailer reaction and also the consumer reaction. So we could see very low costs if the marketers, the retailers, and the consumers are indifferent about mandatory labels, but we could see really tremendous costs if, if producers are having to substitute to non-GE inputs and also, so non-GE inputs are more expensive, but if they, in addition to having to substitute non-GE inputs, have to pay for segregation, auditing, verification, testing, this is gonna tremendously increase the costs. Um, so this table, I don't, I don't have time to, to talk about everything that I've got in the presentation, but this table talks about those sequential responses of, of um, consumers, retailers, and producers. Um, so, um, so again, uh, we maintain, I maintain that this national standard provides zero benefits um, based on the premise that the benefits are based on a misunderstanding of science. Um, but it does preempt state regulations, which is going to facilitate um, uh, 
producers getting their products to markets without having to pay penalties. It in ensures consistency. Um, so these are the categories of costs. And I'll just talk through the last several slides really quickly. They're going to be costs from labeling food with, with QR codes, maintaining websites potentially if, if the QR code is directing them to a website. Um, again, substituting non-GE inputs for the GE inputs that used to be in the processed products, segregating it, documenting the segregation. Possibly from shipping and marketing parallel lines of GE and non-GE foods. For example, um, Cheerios, certain types of Cheerios don't have corn in them. Certain types do. And so there are going to be some, there are some Cheerios out there that have the non-GMO project verified label on them, I believe. Um, certainly if it's not Cheerios, some types of cereal would have, would have this coming up. Um, and then um, there are also going to be costs from enforcement and litigation. So we don't know how the law is going to be enforced, but there are definitely going to be potential costs from enforcing it. Cost of labeling is relatively trivial. A couple hundred million dollars a year for the country as a whole. It's less than a dollar per person. But, and, and, and so we're certainly going to see costs from changing labels. But a couple hundred million dollars sounds like a lot of money to individuals. It's not a lot of money spread across the whole country. But if we see a, a general shift away from GE inputs to non-GE inputs, we could see uh, increased cost of food in the range of tens of billions of dollars. So this is based not on my original work, but on Bill Lesser from Cornell. Um, and we extrapolated it for the US as a whole. Um, there are going to be costs from segregation, verification, monitoring. Uh, it could be somewhere between 3 and $10 billion. Um, and then warehousing is going to be, again, in the range of hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, so this table summarizes those costs from the, from the previous studies that are out there. Again, the cost of labeling alone is going to be around $200 million a year, probably uh, relatively small in terms of the total value of the U.S. food industry. But the costs from complete replacement of GE with non-GE or organic ingredients, segregation, certification, monitoring, it's going to be somewhere between $7 billion and $100 billion based on the literature, based on the estimates that have been done. And that's a really wide range. It's really impossible to compare the benefits of the regulation with the costs of the regulation when the range of expected costs is so wide and depends so much on how consumers and marketers respond to the law. Um, in the long run, there are going to be some additional costs. Increased demand for land for agriculture It's going to increase the costs even further. Reduced incentives for ag R&D. Um, I mean, the Hawaii papaya industry wouldn't exist today if not for GE technology. And with climate change, this is going to be exacerbated. These problems like this are going to be exacerbated as diseases and um, strange weather events spread around the world. Citrus greening is a huge problem in Florida. It's likely to be solved only through genetic engineering. Um, so uh, for, for y'all, for this context at the produce show, um, Think about the non-GMO label. Think about the, both the, the beautiful seal with the butterfly and more generic statements that just say non-GMO. Um, this might be a good way to differentiate products, especially if they're low cost. If your product is already certainly non-GMO, it, it may be especially low cost. Um, if you have to have a disclosure statement, the QR code is likely to be relatively inexpensive. I created one for free. Um, you don't have to maintain a website. It can just have a text message. Um, and so um, that's about it in terms of implications for the produce industry. Um, but uh, in the paper that, as I said, I have forthcoming, um, we conclude that the national federal standard is clumsy and incoherent because of this problem of transmitting information to consumers and consumers not fully understanding the message. The QR codes are certainly not the best way of reaching consumers, especially if the QR codes can link to a message that say something meaningless like may contain GE ingredients. But at the same time, it's certainly an improvement. It makes things easier for everybody uh, relative to a situation where there were a patchwork of state level regulations. Um, it could possibly be reasonably inexpensive. Um, but again, I have to raise the question of whether the perceived benefits of information provision 
overcome the cost when the perceived benefits are based on misunderstanding of science. And that's again from Cass Sunstein. Um, so here are a couple of references, articles that I've, that I've written on this and related topics. Um, you can contact me, I'd love to hear from you. Um, John Bove at uconn.edu. Thanks, I'm happy to take questions. Questions for Professor Bove? I have uh, one question. Okay. You've provided a tremendous amount of information today about a complicated subject, a dynamic subject. What's the best way that we in the industry can keep up to date on what's happening and what direction it's taking? Well, I understand that USDA, USDA has to release final regulation that would have all the details about what the disclosure standard is going to look like by July 2018. And I understand that they're going to release proposed rules prior to that. So um, I guess uh, just keeping, keeping apprised of the news on whether USDA has released that proposed rule, commenting on that rule to USDA, that they'll, they'll take consideration of those comments as they're making the final rule. Um, uh, that's that's what, you, what you've got to do to get ready for the law that's going to be on the books in July 2018. Any other? John? Um, at another trade show presentation on, on, on GMO labeling, mm -hmm. um, they discussed uh, the, the non-GMO type labels, the commercial type right. uh, ap um, attributes. And the advice was, do not put these labels on. You may paint yourself into a corner, and at some point, you're the citrus industry, and you n now need to use GMO, or yeah. you're the California wine industry, and all of a sudden, your um, uh, your your rootstocks are GM. Right. You know now now so now you got to go backwards. And I go, how would you kind of respond to that well, advice? I, I think that's I think that's great advice, John. And I think that. Um, when I think that economists frequently talk about trade-offs, and these are simply trade-offs. You have to consider what the short-run and long-run possible gains from using the label are. And you're right; it, there could be uh, it could be dangerous down the road if if the Florida orange industry is putting a non-GMO label on it now, but two years from now, they're they're really happy to have genetically engineered oranges. It could be a problem. It could be a problem for competition, especially if the California oranges still carry the non-GMO label. Professor Bovey, thank you very much for your presentation today. Thank you all. Sure, appreciation.